Welcome to the Lean Solutions Podcast, where we discuss business solutions to help listeners develop and implement action plans for true lean process improvement. I am your host, Patrick Adams. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Lean Solutions Podcast. My name is Patrick Adams, and my guest today is Mark DeLuzio. Mark is the founder and chief executive officer of Lean Horizons Consulting. He is also a former corporate officer and vice president of Danaher Business System for Danaher Corporation. Mark is also credited with developing the first lean accounting process in the United States for Danaher's Jake Brake division, where he served as their chief financial officer. Mark is the author of Turn Waste into Wealth, as well as Flatlined, Why Lean Transformations Fail and What to Do About It. Welcome to the show, Mark. Patrick, thank you. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Uh, we had some great conversations uh, before we hit record, and I uh, wish we would have recorded a little bit earlier. But hopefully, we can. Yeah, dive I think that con- I think that conversation was a podcast all by itself. <laughs> I think so too. Uh, yeah, well, we may, maybe we should start recording the pre uh, conversation today. There you go. There you go. <laughs> but anyways, I I really uh, I I love um, the your book flatlined why transformations fail and what Thank to you. do about. It. And it, it is the age old question, um, you know, why do transformations fail? And I, I'd really like to just kind of dive in right there with, the, the, you know, the toughest question that I think has been posed out there because, you know, we can learn a lot from successes, right? But, you know, we can learn so much more from failures. Uh, and so I just want to ask you, you know, what are your thoughts? What have you learned? Uh, can you just fill our listeners in a little bit on what you think, you know, is going on with, with lean Transformation. Well, I just want to make it clear up front. I've never had a failure. I've never made a mistake. Okay. So I just want to let you know that. All right. Uh, all right. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> no, you know, it's funny. Uh, uh, I was at a conference uh, a while back and uh, the conference uh, founder, you know, uh, I said to him, you know, I'm, I've been going to this conference every, every year or so. And it's like, everybody gets up and talks about their successes. I said, would you mind if next year I can come back as a keynote speaker and just talk about how I screwed up. There you go. Wow. You'd be willing to do that. Yeah. I said, I think people learn more from that than, uh, than not. Right. So I have a whole presentation called humble errors. Mm. The, the mistakes we made in developing the Dan, her business system. Okay. We made a lot of mistakes, a lot of that. Uh, but you know, back then there weren't a lot of consultants. Well, maybe that's a good thing, but there weren't a lot of consultants to go after and misdirect you in turn. What's that's, what's going on today. I think in, in a lot of ways, so Flatline, really, uh, Patrick, is is about a book. Why did I pick that name? Yeah, I would get calls from CEO, CEOs. You know, they teach the Danaher business system at Harvard, and I've spoken at MIT and all these schools and, and at Harvard and at Kellogg. And they go to these schools and they teach the Danaher business system, and the CEO will call me back and say, hey, by the way, I just got my OPM certificate at Harvard, and they talked about DBS. That was the most interesting part of the whole course. And we found that you're the principal architect and we want to do DBS mm. because we've been doing lean for 10 years and our business has flatlined. They use that yeah. word, right? Yeah. So after a while, I kind of thought that was a good, uh, a good name. Although people sometimes think the book is about, uh, you know, uh, medical uh, heart uh, <laughs> cardiology or whatever. And so, um, so what I, what I, what I, I, they would say, we want to do the Dan and her business system. And I think as I told you earlier, I would say, well, if you want to do the Danaher business system, go work for Danaher, okay? Right. Because you can't do it. You got to do it your own. Create your own system with your own culture, your own people, your own industry, mm. and 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 all that. You can't just copy people. You can't yeah. copy Toyota. You there's know, not like five and, steps to to uh, become Toyota or five steps to become Danaher. You can't there's you can't give no, us no, the, no, the no. roadmap. No, no. You know, I tell people, once you become Toyota-like, but you can't become like Toyota. Okay, mm-hmm. that's a little different, right? Yeah. And so so what I've observed doing this for quite a few years, I mean, well, well going on four decades now, uh, and I've been in all kinds of industries. I've been into fr- even things like fracking and oil and gas and insurance and logging. And, and the one thing I will tell you, Patrick, is that the principles of lean apply. I don't care what business you have, they apply. That's right. Now, how you do it and how what tools you pick and how you approach that, everybody gets really hung up on the tools. 
Mm-hmm. And by the way, you've got to be really good at the tools. Don't get me wrong about that, but it's not enough. And, and, and the, the argument I always make is I have in my garage right now, I have, I know how to use almost every tool that's out there, but I don't know how to build a house. Mm-hmm. And, and the bottom line is a, a lean transformation is like building a house. Yeah, right. That's right. There's a lot goes into that. Right. So what I look at is what are the, what I've observed of, of failures over the years of companies who tried to transform and failed, when I say failed, that's a harsh word, mm-hmm. but let's say they didn't realize what they really should have realized had they thought about it differently. So the things I look at is this. Number one, a lot of CEOs and a lot of leaders want to do lean because they look at a short-term cost reduction tool and they're going to try to drive their performance or you know their profits or stock price, whatever. And... I try to get to the point where cost is a result of doing everything else right. Mm-hmm. In other words, you know, you, you've got your safety, which is the first priority, and then your quality is your next, and your delivery and service to your customer is third. In that order, then the last is cost, and 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 it seems as if many companies, uh, and and that will be a result. The cost, if you do those first things right, cost will take care of itself. Productivity. And growth, by the way, and that's the best thing you could do because anybody can lay people off. That's easy. You don't need a, you know, a PhD in business to, to lay people off. Mm-hmm. Matter of fact, it's almost a cowardly thing to do. Mm-hmm. But if you can't, as a, as a leader, say to your people, hey, look, we're going to have a no layoff policy as a result of improvements in lean, then you're not going to get the buy-in and, and it's going to be a joke. Okay. So, so safety, quality, delivery, cost in that order and so they usually just look at it instead of SQDC, they look at it as CCCC. <laughs> okay, mm-hmm. everything's cost. Everything okay. got to be cost justified, and it drives drives and, and it won't work. Okay, never once, by the way, in the decade I worked for George Sherman, when I developed, you know, part of you know leading the team that developed the Danaher business system, did George ever ask me how much money did the DBS office save, Mark? Mm. What do you guys, what kind of numbers did you put up this year? Never had that question. I, I, I was challenged on a lot of other things, don't get me wrong, sure. but, but not that, not that. Because he understood that the people who own the businesses needed to be responsible and accountable, right? right. And so, uh, and, and I tell people that they don't believe me. So number one is uh, they, they look at it as a, as a cost reduction tool and only focus on cost. Secondly, they don't tie their lean initiatives to strategy. So what they do is they're all over the place in terms of, you know, let's fly best the mail room. Okay, that's great. Grab some pizza and we'll have a party on Friday afternoon. Yeah. And I'm not saying you shouldn't fly best the mail room, okay? But what I am saying is you need to focus your resources. And as you know, coming out of your background and your career, you can't be everything to everybody. So you actually have to decide what not to do. So we, I put in the policy deployment process in the early 90s, and they're still using it today. It's a big part of the Danaher business system. And, and, and uh, that was a game changer for, for the Danaher business system. Mm-hmm. That, that took us out of the, you know, the process improvement, although did, that didn't go away, to a more strategic look at what we were doing. Right, right. right. So strategy deployment, what I call strategy deployment, Danaher still calls it policy deployment because that's how I learned it from the Japanese. Sure. Um, so tying to strategy, when we initially started, we called it the Danaher Production System, and it is we, we changed the name to the Danaher Business System because we knew it had to apply to the whole business, not just to manufacturing, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But when we changed the name, we didn't really know what that meant. We thought, well, at that time, we thought oh, it was just about functions. We got to have a good HR department, a great IT department, great engineering, great account, you know, great finance, great whatever, go down the list of functions. But as we got going more, and especially with strategy deployment, when you have to enlist multifunctional teams to work together for a common breakthrough, because no breakthrough that I've met yet is a single function. Um, we found out that it was an enterprise play, not a functional play. Mm-hmm. So the enterprise has to work or the functions have to work together as one cohesive enterprise, not, and, and I will say this to you, Patrick, if any one function tries to optimize themselves, they will sub-optimize the enterprise. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, and I've seen that happen time and time again. All right. Uh, thirdly, 
Oh, uh, that's third. I'm sorry. Uh, fourth, it's all about leadership. So there's really four things. It's it's a it's a function focus on tools and and driving for cost only, the tie to strategy, the enterprise focus versus just functional approach, and then the leadership engagement in here's the real key here how do you get a senior leader who's made it to these lofty positions and tell them well what got you here no longer is going to apply and you have to think differently Mm -hmm. so when you get into the leadership realm you start talking about what's this whole business about respect for people which is a really key thing because lean's about people not about machines not about products and engineering not about standard work. All, yeah, all these things are part of that, but it's, if, if you don't focus on the people, you're going to lose. And then the other thing is, how are leaders going to be engaged and are they willing to change? I have a saying that says, Kaizen yourself first before you start Kaizen the rest of the organization, because a lot of leaders will tell me, well, I got to get my people to change. Mm-hmm. Really? Well, maybe you should start with you. Yeah, because if you don't fall, you know, so the, so that whole leadership side of this thing, and then in that in that category, is the returning back to basics. Because as you probably know as well as I do, Patrick, there are so many Tayashi ta- Ono wannabes out there today. Sure, they want to put a name out there and write a new book and just repackage things, and you know, work on the basics. Right, and I tell CEOs all the time: if you're a football p- fan. Vince Lombardi took his future Hall of Famers who were a lousy, uh, lousy team, I should say. And his first practice was he held up a football and he said, gentlemen, this is a football. Then he, he, he focused on the, 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 the basics of tackling, of passing, of blocking. He was a basic guy. He'd probably puke on the West Coast offense today with a shotgun, right? <laughs> okay. Right. He was a basic guy and look at the results he got. Go back to basics. There's no silver bullet. And, you know, just just do the basics and you won't believe how good that will get you. So anyway, th- that's that's really the a long answer to your question about why lean transformations fail. But these are patterns I've seen over the years. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They're not, they're not just like one off type things. Right. Well, they, they, I mean, super powerful. Every one of those is uh probably worth a, an entire episode on. Oh, sure. Excuse me. But let's let's try to break these down a little bit. Um, the, one of the, the first ones that you mentioned was business strategy. Right. Uh, so let's break, let's, let's dive into that one just a little bit. Can you explain the importance of having a business strategy and, and the ability to deploy and execute that strategy pro- properly? And how did you guys do it at Danaher? What, what was the, the the success that came out of that? Yeah, we were always successful at it, by the way. So we had a change, okay? And this is where the Danaher business system became an all-encompassing type of approach. Okay. Um, First of all, let's talk about what strategy is. How we define it at Danaher, very simply, what game are you playing and how are you going to win? That's it. Forget about all the textbooks and everything else. That's it. If you can't define clearly what game you're playing, and Larry Culp, uh, who's now running GE, he and I actually sat down and put the, the strategy development process together we wanted standard work as to how we do a strategy okay so many of our businesses all thought they knew strategy and they were missing some fundamentals including things like SWOT analysis and simple things like that but anyway um and he had a saying he said the quality of the strategy is inversely related to the thickness of the presentation Hmm. okay you know the thicker the presentation the more convoluted the story was you should be able to articulate your strategy on an elevator in 20 seconds Yes. You know, what, what's your strategy, your company? It's this, this, and this, right? So, so anyway, um, the strategy, let me, let me just go back and, and, and differentiate a little bit on strategy here, because a lot of people say, Hey, we're, lean's going to be our strategy. Well, how did that work out for Delphi? Mm-hmm. They were some of the best lean companies in Delphi. They won all kinds of Shingo awards, but they're no longer a company, are they? Right. Okay. So, uh, so, uh, you could be making buggy whips and cement life preservers. You've got a bad strategy, okay? You've got a bad product approach and all that. So you have to have a winning business strategy and 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 use lean to able accelerate and drive that strategy, okay? So if you, and, and I will hold this too, if you're a commodity business and the only thing you compete on right now is price, you could take yourself out of the commodity uh, category 
by simply being the best in quality and the best in on-time delivery and lead time. All of a sudden, as a matter of fact, one of the white papers I'm going to be writing very soon is going to be, there's no such thing as a commodity, all right? And we had a, a new acquisition that was a commodity, and uh, we took, a, you know, I went in and talked to the managing director. who was over in England, and I said, he's 28-day lead time. His competition is at 35. I said, well, you don't have a real advantage. And he thought he did. I said, I can get you down to three days. And we did. In like nine months, we got him down to three days. He more than tripled the business because he was the best guy out there. And he got price on a commodity product. It went from 30,000 units to 110,000 units. So you can grow the business. And that's what Lean's all about. That's right. And, 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 it, and, and, and grown profitably, providing employee security, number, number, number first and from, foremost. But the strategy has to be, has to be addressing your three major constituents, which are your employers, your customers, and your shareholders. And I know there's others. In the book, I talk about the Lean Trilogy of those three cat, th those three uh, stakeholders. And if you don't meet the objectives of all three, and some, by the way, may be in conflict with each other, you're not going to have a sustainable long-term win. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of people think about the shareholder and the bottom line and e earnings per share and things like that. Mm -hmm. And they probably think some other about the customer. Not really understand what the customer wants. And employees, that's all lip service. Hardly we ever asked them. So all all three of these have to be subjected to the plan, do, check, act process. Mm -hmm. Am I hitting their objectives? And if not, why? And what's my countermeasures? And what's my A3 look like? And, and all that. We don't think about strategy that way, right? We just think about how can I sell more and make more money, right? Right. And, and grab market share. And I'm not downplaying that, but there's more to it than that. Because if you don't address the the, the, the engine that drives that. And by the way, suppliers are included in strategy uh, mm -hmm. in, as a stakeholder, your community, the environment, all the, all those kind of things, right? Absolutely. So, anyway, so that's, so strategy, lean by itself is not a strategy. You have to have a business strategy that lean will, uh, will enable you to accelerate that and, and beat your competition in that regard. So. Mm -hmm. Well, what, what at, uh, at Danaher, how did you connect the, maybe the, the long-term strategy or the business strategy, how did that get connected all the way down to the frontline workers and, uh, and everything in between? What, 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 what did you use? Is there any yep. specific uh, tools or, or techniques that you use to, to make the connection? Well, we were very clear on breakthrough strategy with strategy deployment or policy deployment, as we call mm -hmm. it, in daily management. Okay, and the way I like to explain this to people is this way. Think about your business and think about all the processes that run your business. I don't care if it's how do you open up an envelope when it comes in on the mail, to how you pay a bill, to how you do payroll, to how you design product, to how you whatever. Think about thousands of these processes, right? And by the way, I have a, I have a thing called uh, my 10 rules of a process. If it's not documented, you can't call it a process, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the first rule of, of, the, of the 10. But anyway, you've got all these processes. Which are the game? Which are the four, three or four, of those processes are game changers for you, that are going to really drive your business. Then all the other processes are more functional, and they just have to be done really darn well. Okay, so if I'm going to be, you know, paying invoices and accounts payable, being the best accounts payable department is not going to be strategic for me. But I've got to do that because breakthrough strategy depends on good sound fundamental daily management systems okay so i've got to do all those things really really well and i've got to be looking at my kpis for each one of those all housed in my daily management in safety quality delivery and cost and keep driving performance in those in that regard but the four or five things that are really key for my business sometimes it's only one and i'll give you one example we wanted to break into the japanese asian market to be kind of cyclical at Jake break. Mm -hmm. Our new product development cycle was 72 months. Hino Motors, which was, this is part of Toyota, it's one of my customers, was 18 months developing a whole engine that our product went on. We're not gonna play in Japan if we're at 72 months. Right. So our breakthrough for that, for our purposes, was to drive our new product development cycle from 72 to 18 months. It wasn't about improving productivity in the shop, okay? Mm -hmm. That wasn't breakthrough. Right. In fact, we went from four kits per 100 man hours to 45. So it wasn't no longer breakthrough. That was relegated to daily management. 
So once you achieve a breakthrough and the process is to sustain at that level, it gets relegated back to your daily manager because that's just how you do business now. And then the next breakthrough comes along, right? But that one there, we had to work uh, on getting 72 months to 18. And the funny thing was, when we got there, Hino was at 16. Hmm. You, you know, they don't, st- they don't, that's what people don't understand. They don't, st- they don't stop, right? Right. And stand still. So there's an example there that there are things within Jake Break that weren't, weren't breakthrough for us. Mm-hmm. And we were going to really focus a majority, or I'd say 60, 70% of our lean resources on the fundamental breakthroughs for a particular business. Now, some companies, their safety, quality, delivery, and costs are such a mess, or fundamental operating performance a mess, that is the breakthrough for them. And we had a saying that I, I developed called, you have to earn the right to grow. Mm-hmm. So if you don't, if you don't, if you, if your fundamentals are just broken and really bad and you've got customers complaints and bad quality and all kinds of issues, bad safety, whatever, that's your breakthrough. Then you can't grow in that kind of environment. You've got to fix the fundamentals that's right, right. first. So that's how we treated acquisitions when we got new acquisitions. So from a strategic perspective, what are the things that we have to do that we don't know how to do now? That's the definition of breakthrough mm-hmm. that are going to be real game changers out there today. And strategy is a process. It's not a one time a year deal. Right. So we took that long term. We, we went out three years. Some go out five, but we went out three years for a strategy. But through the strategy deployment or policy deployment process, we, we distilled down the things we had to do in the, in the year itself. Right. And got it down to the month and got it down to the week. And, and we, we looked at the things that we had to, had to accomplish in order to uh, support that three-year breakthrough. Okay. Right. And that's where the deployment of, of your strategy, strategy deployment, ocean planning, some people call it, mm-hmm. ocean conry. But it's not one of those deals where everybody gets involved. Everybody says, well, we got to have the janitor involved in our strategy. No, 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 no. You don't want the janitor. In, I, I love the janitor. Okay. And I treat the janitor no different than the CEO. But you want to know something? No, the janitor doesn't get involved in the strategy. Sorry. There's certain people that have to run the business. Okay. You have to come in every day and put out product, pay the bills, develop, design the product, and, and work on those processes that are maybe relegated to daily management and improve those through Kaizen. Okay, great. But not everybody can be involved in breakthrough because mm-hmm. you got to run the business. So – that's a big miss, I think, in Hoshin planning where everybody gets deployed the same goals and everybody's involved and it all disseminates down to, you know, the janitor, right? And and no, that's not how we did it at Danaher. And I don't think that works long term. Because mm-hmm. I think all that is a lot of feel good stuff going on and it's a lot of busy work. And and you know, no, don't that's not to say that every department, every function doesn't have their daily management goals to say, sure. hey, we got to improve quality, productivity, whatever it is, right? Okay, fine. But to put that into strategy deployment, we thought about it differently than even maybe Toyota does, right? Sure. That makes sense. No, that's very valuable. Good, good information. Hey everyone, this is Patrick. So sorry to interrupt this episode of the Lean Solutions Podcast, but I felt it necessary to take a quick moment and personally invite you to the Lean Solutions Summit on October 2nd to the 4th this fall, 2023. The theme of this year's global summit is leadership, people, purpose, passion. You do not want to miss this amazing experience with the top process improvement experts from your industry. No matter what industry you're working in, this summit has value for you. The summit offers four different industry tracks to include healthcare, corporate, higher education and nonprofit, and finally, government. Our opening keynote is Chris McChesney, the lead author of the number one Wall Street Journal best-selling business book, The Four Disciplines of Execution. The Op Sisters, Kathy Miller and Shannon Carrolls, the authors of Steel Toes and Stilettos will be joining us as well as yours truly and over 20 other speakers. The final day of the summit is full of workshops and there are limited seats for a tour of Menlo Innovations with Richard Sheridan and Zingerman's Mail Order with Dr. Jeff Liker, author of The Toyota Way. Early bird pricing is now available at Findling Solutions forward slash summit dash 2023 or you can check the show notes for a link. Now, back to the show. You talked a lot about the the difference between uh, companies looking at growth versus cost cutting. And I have to imagine that there, there's going to have to be some change made to the accounting systems. 
So, you know, as the father of lean accounting, how important is it to to change the accounting systems when embarking on a lean transformation? What, what, what's been your experience there? And can you talk to us? Because this is an area I think that doesn't get talked about. People just move ahead and don't make changes to, to their cost accounting or to their uh, accounting systems. So what's what would you say to uh, to that question? Well, Patrick, I would I would you know I would say to you that probably the most you know fundamental problems with a transformation is that uh, comes out of the financial world. Yeah. Okay, and 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 uh, financial accountants who uh, who are sitting there with their clipboard looking at the results, evaluating the lean process. So, so here's how I look at it. You could, when you're doing a lean transformation, you could either be in the arena with the lions or you can be in the stands watching everybody. Mm-hmm. And those financial CFOs that sit in the stands to watch, not realizing that their participation is critical to the success, Yes, but they refuse to get into the, into the lion spit. And then they're standing there with the clipboard, and then they finally say, "Well, you know, this isn't working. Let's gonna, we're going to lay off the lean department. We're going to, you know, it's right. not working." And they don't get they don't get anything that's going on in that regard, and they treat it like a program as opposed to a transformational cultural change, right? Right. And and so, uh, the, the if you go back on the traditional financial measures that I got taught in cost. I, I grew up as a cost accountant first mm-hmm. and foremost before I went into operations and into general management. And I had, I, I've worked, I worked at Lego. I worked at uh, some unbelievable companies that uh, with some of the best, I believe cost accountants in the world. Mm-hmm. And I was trained like you wouldn't believe on, I was a very good cost accountant, traditional one-on-one type stuff. I do not do all that once I started learning lean. I'm saying, you know, these measures are causing us to do bad things, unlean things, like absorption accounting. Mm-hmm. No, I don't want to build more inventory so I can, I can, I can capitalize my my labor and overhead costs into inventory into the balance sheet. No, I don't want to do that because it's going to have to come out sooner or later. That's okay? right. Okay, and it's a cash flow issue, right? I don't want to go back to the principles. Did I violate just in time principles? Yes, absorption accounting violates just in time. Uh, I don't want purchase price. For, I don't want my purchasing guys to buy more because they're saving and, and getting favorable purchase price variance to some nebulous standard cost. Standard costs are, are an enemy to lean. Mm-hmm. And then and every every single, I would say 90, eh, not 90, maybe 75% of the, of the discussions on variance analysis to a standard all had to do with why the standard was wrong. That was the debate. It wasn't a performance. It was a big joke. Standard cost, and there's a lot of time involved in putting standard costs together. I've done so many conversions over the years and thought I was doing a really good job. And I look back now, boy, what a disaster that was. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, so purchase price variance, variance analysis, the whole concept, for example, of indirect and direct labor ratio. We got taught in school that direct labor is value added and, and indirect is not. Well, you tell that to a NASCAR driver, Okay. <laughs> His pit crew is indirect labor. Right. Let's get rid of, let's let's do some cost reduction. And get rid of that. <laughs> or, you know, maybe he could change his own tires, which go all goes into water spiders and sure. how you think about teams on single minute exchange of die. So we got rid of that notion. Now I'm not saying we should be foolish with indirect, if you want to call it indirect labor. Um, we should be foolish in that regard. But what I am saying is that no, those guys are necessary because what we learned is operators should operate. I want my operator on their standard work sequence as long as possible without any interruption. I don't want them looking for tooling. I don't want them looking for materials. I want them to operate in their work sequence. No different than I want that driver to be on that racetrack as much as possible. That's, That's right. his work sequence. Okay. So I use these analogies, right? And 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 so so all the things that we learned, and there's others, by the way, other that we how we measure ourselves and how we look at ourselves. Uh, is 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 just bad and, and, and it causes the wrong decisions mm-hmm. but you can incent the right de- decisions if you have the right managerial accounting system now one of the things a lot of c i'm a cma but a lot of C cpas don't understand is you don't have to have gap compliant SOX compliant internal management accounting you could do it any way you want yeah your external reporting has to be such to whatever standards are out there mm-hmm. but you don't have to do that internally 
So, for example, when one of my guys at Jake Break bought six months' worth of tooling, his tooling cost per unit went through the roof. And mm -hmm. he complained to me about it. I said, I don't care. Uh, you know, but I'm not using all that tooling. Don't you guys amortize it? No, not in my system. I don't. You want to know why? You bought too much. But, but Mark, you don't believe the savings I got on it. Yeah, Bill. Well, what happens if the design changes right. and the tooling is no longer good? You just bought, and, you, and what about the cash flow? Mm -hmm. You know, go back to your daily life. Would you buy six months worth of uh, motor oil for your car or six months worth of, uh, of uh, groceries, right? For all the obvious reasons, you wouldn't do it. Right. But in business, we do different things. We don't treat, we don't, I talk about this in a book. We don't, we don't work our lives, run our lives the same way we run our business. Okay. Why? He got a discount. He thought he was going to get a pat on the back. Well, he didn't get one from me. Okay. Because he, he used our cash. <laughs> okay. Right. So he returned four months of it and he got a credit. Okay. So I said, no, I'm not going to amortize it. Yeah, but accounting says you should do it. Yeah. Well, guess what? We're not doing that. We're not doing that. Another one was machine depreciation. And, uh, and he came, the same guy came to me once and he said, hey, what's this machine depreciation charge? So I explained it. And he said, well, geez, Mark, I've got eight machines in my cell. I only need six, really. If I get rid of two, am I going to save? Uh, yeah. There were $250,000 machines. Okay, two of them. The next month, I said, put them in the graveyard. I'll, I'll make the adjustment, right? So we made the adjustment. His cost went down. <laughs> He's, next month, I got a capital appropriation request from another guy named Marshall. And I took it and I ripped it up right in front of him. It was for two CNC machines. <laughs> $500,000. Okay. Okay, so it's things like that, right? And, and so uh, you could drive the right behaviors, but you can kill a lean a lean and by the way this all goes back to value stream costing getting rid of overhead overhead percentages are, which are arbitrary and go to direct costing there's a whole science behind it that sure. we put together but at the end of the day if you know real traditional cost accounting and compare it to what i did at, at lean accounting it, it it's embarrassingly simple everything's as complex it's even simpler than what you learned in school so yeah and that's probably i mean that's definitely uh uh a topic that we can talk about probably for a, a few hours because I would love to dive into some of those details. Uh, but maybe, maybe in the next uh, next time we have you on the show, we'll, we'll dive into lean accounting a little bit further. Be happy to do uh, so. Yeah. <laughs> right. One of the things that I've heard, you know, uh, kind of woven throughout every uh, topic that you've hit on so far is this the the concept of respect for people. And uh, you know, I'd I'd be really interested to hear about your experience at Danaher and, and some of the other companies that you've worked for um, around respect for people and the role that that plays in uh, the success of a lean transformation. Well, you know, at the end of the day, um, nobody's perfect at it, even Toyota. <clears throat> and, uh, and, and by the way, respect sometimes is in, is in the eye or the beholder. Uh, one of the things I think is a big misnomer today, because on LinkedIn, you'd see all kinds of people complaining about their boss, right? Mm -hmm. You never hardly see people complaining about their employees. And if you think about an, a leader, they have 10 of these little darlings complaining about them because they all think they could do the guy's job or the gal's job better, right? Uh, and by the way, some of it's warranted. I'm not saying that. But, um, but the respect thing, the first thing I'll say about respect is that you have no right to demand my respect. You have to earn it. And, and we, people don't get that. People Today, people just think, employees in particular, subordinates in particular, think that you have to respect me. Okay? And you don't, you don't, you don't, you, you can't ask me of that. You have to earn my respect. At least that's how I think about it. Yeah. However, it doesn't mean you, you need to be disrespectful to people who don't have your respect, okay? There's a difference. So so as you look at respect for people, and, and if you go back to how Toyota thinks about it, they don't only think about it from a people perspective, and it's probably misnamed because it's respect for your your customers, it's respect for your shareholders, your, your suppliers, your environment, your community. Oh yeah, by the way, even their competition they put in that category. Respect for their competition. Which is, I never heard any company do that, by the way. And so, so the whole respect thing is getting a lot of press and all that. And, uh, but, you know, one of the things I always said was if you just treat somebody the way you want to be treated, 
you'll be fine. You know, and, uh, and I'll tell you a quick story. I'm not going to get into names or anything like this or even the company, but uh, I was running operations. I got called in by the president and we were a UAW shop. And uh, he said to me, uh, Mark, I got, can you close the door? I got, I got a problem. I just had a, a meet and greet with your people this afternoon. And well, I'm a little concerned. I go, well, what's wrong? He says, they absolutely love working for you. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, great. Yeah, I, I kind of knew that, but yeah, we have a good relationship. Mark, you don't understand. They're 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 a union, it's a union shop. You're not supposed to have that kind of relationship with the union people. Mm. And we we're you know UAW, and I negotiated a couple of the contracts, and uh, I go, well, I'm not I'm not getting what you're saying. Well, you just can't have that kind. of, The ladies love working for you. I go, well, yeah, they're like kind of like they they think I'm their son, you know. <laughs> they're older ladies, and they, they took me under their wing like they're watching out for me, you know. I said, but we have a lot of fun, Greg. Yeah, I, we have a lot of fun. I said, you know, we, 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 uh, we, we I asked for their ideas. We, we, we make, we, we actually, in a fun way, make fun of each other. They make fun of me. We just have a lot of fun, you know. We poke fun, fun at each other, and they love coming to work, you know. And uh, I said, by the way, I said, uh, the performance in these areas have never been met before in this company. Is that a problem? Well, no, Mark, but I, I don't think you get what I'm saying. I, I tell you what, let me go out and I'm going to go piss them off. I could do that real easy. I'm good at it. Okay. Yeah. Just like you're doing to me right now. Okay. Right. <laughs> no, no, that's not what I'm saying. Okay. So you see, you know, so what I'm trying to say here is that how we think about people. I said, and I said to this president, look, my father was 44 years at New Britain Machine as a tool and die maker, never missed a day of work in his life, except when he went to fight in World War II and he was at the Battle of Iwo Jima. Okay? Mm. So I said, um, when I see those people out there, I see my father, right? Sorry, if you want somebody to piss him off, you're gonna have to find somebody else. Right. Right. And I left the, and I left his office. Mm. And that was the last that was ever said. So I'm telling you that story because, you know, people have different notions about classes of people and they won't treat the janitor the same as they do some, some muckety muck executive, right? Mm -hmm. I treat everybody the same. I mean, I met the president of the United States and I treated, and my wife said, you're not even nervous. I said, no, man, I want to have beer with this guy, you know? Right. And, uh, you know, and, 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 uh, and and I just nobody intimidates me from that regard, and 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 I, I just you know I'm going to treat you and and anybody and no matter what your position is, I look at your character, your values, and all that. Mm -hmm. And but you know I guess I guess everybody there's a lot of talk about this, but we don't. So I think the thing about respect for people is all these things that we say. I want to solve problems at the lowest possible level. Teamwork is important. Uh, blah 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 blah. You go on and on. They're all slogans if they're not backed up by our process, okay? You can put them on a poster and it looks really good to the outside world, but the people inside know it's not true yeah. if you don't do it, okay? I was with a, with a, a, a group, a CEO and his team, a multi-billion dollar company, and I said, how many people here think that uh, uh, career development is a really key part of leadership? Oh, yeah, yeah, we're really big on that, okay. Well, I said, what's your career development process? They didn't have one. Hmm. Did anybody here have a career development plan? No. Uh, okay, what about solving problems at the lowest possible, highest necessary level? Yeah, we're all into that. Yeah, well, it's not happening, right? Right. Do you have a process? No. Okay, then how's it going to happen? You know, so, so I came up with this slogan for a slogan. It says, you know, uh, principles and values without an underlying process are merely slogans. Hmm. They are. You've got to know. Do you really know the the goals of your people and what they're what's important to them? Right. Or do you think you know? I thought I knew what Hino Motors wanted until I found out it was one hundred six out of one hundred ten, with one hundred percent quality, one hundred percent zero warranty. 100% on-time delivery from Connecticut to their request date at Hino City, Japan. 100%. I was 106 out of 110 on diesel engines. Want to know why? Because my labels weren't always exactly in the same part on the box. Hmm. I mean, 
a different game over there with Toyota, right? Different game. I mean, quality and delivery were just given. So that's an entree. Just to be in, to be S to the dance. That was just an entree. Hmm. Okay. And and I didn't realize. They said, and I and I argued, and they said, Delizio son. You don't, I said, no, it doesn't affect form, fit, or function. No, come on, what, what's going on here, guys? So let's just, son, you don't understand. If you cannot guarantee the quality outside of the box, how can you guarantee the quality inside the box? Mm. Okay. So anyway, understanding the goals and how do you do that is a whole process in and of itself. Yeah. Not everybody's going to tell you. But anyway, this whole oh. respect for people is, is, is a very important part, and it's the biggest reason why I think – these things fail, uh, the lean transformations fail. Mm. And if you can't guarantee no layoffs due to lean improvements, you can't lay off tens of thousands of people like some companies have done and call it lean. Yeah. Sorry. Any Never. idiot can lay people off. Anybody can lay somebody off. Okay. You can't call that lean. Right. All right. I don't know what you would call it, but it's not lean. Right. So. I agree hundred percent. So Mark, Amazing. Uh, love, love everything you've talked about uh, and you've hit on a lot of different points. Uh, one of the questions that I did have uh, to kind of wrap things up here is sure. uh, just specific to the Danaher business system. If you could pick one thing uh, and maybe you can't, I don't know, but what would you say made the Danaher business system so successful out of everything we've talked about? Is there anything you could pinpoint or say this is it, you know, or no, is there multiple things? I would have to say consistency of leadership and the belief that what the Danaher business system could mean for all stakeholders was never wavered from, from CEO to CEO, no matter who it was. And George was the first. Yeah. But it started with Art Byrne and, and George Konensaker, who hired me, and, and Jake Brake. And if Jake Brake didn't have the crisis that it did, there'd be no Dan or her business system today. Right. And it was George and Art that basically were the ones that said, okay, well, we got to do something totally different. And that's when we brought, we were the first ones in the United States to bring in Shingajitsu, who are the lieutenants of Tayashi Ono. Okay. We we're the first ones in 1987. And I happened to be working there. I got hired. George hired me at 1987, George and Art. So, so once we saw the magic there, and by the way, we made so many great improvements, but we didn't know what we were doing. We think we did, okay? And we I look back now, and I kind of laugh about how good we thought we were, <laughs> okay? But we made such drastic improvements when George Sherman came in as new CEO, and he sort of somehow liked me, asked me what I want to do with my career. I was already the CFO at an early age, and I said, I want to get into operations. I, they sent me, I went to Japan. George and Art sent me to Japan for the first study mission of several that I've done. And uh, I said, I, I love this stuff. I want to do more of it. So before I knew it, I was one of the Asian business yeah. and uh, and operations and, and the whole business itself. And then George came to me and said, Mark, I want you to do for Danaher what you guys did for Jake Brake. And that was my marching orders for the Danaher business system. Yeah. So it was that belief that if we do this thing right, and, and, and I think we were pretty good on people, but you know what? We weren't perfect. We had a lot of idiots that run some of these businesses. There's some of the guys out there that want to do top grading. I said, well, why don't you top grade yourself? You're the one who hired them. Right. You know, I mean, you know, and I, and I, and I really do believe the Deming philosophy of 94% of problems are, are, are process problems, not people problems. Right. Okay. But we had those idiots that want to do that kind of stuff. We had some really bad leaders too. We had the bell curve, but I'd say our bell curve was more shifted to the, the good leaders than the bad. Okay. And, and, and that was good because we weeded them out after a while, you know, some stayed, some were phenomenal politicians. Let me, let me tell you, but I think every company's got that. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, I think it was probably the end, a one word answer to your question is that belief in, in, in the process not always having the answers and, and, and learning as leaders how to ask the right questions instead of giving the answers, yeah. you know? And, and I'm sitting here saying this, knowing that we were nowhere near, anywhere near perfect. Sure. I mean, it was anything, I may, I may be talking about this as like the holy Mecca here, and it wasn't at all, okay? Mm -hmm. It wasn't at all. There was, in a lot of cases, it was a you-know-what show, uh, okay? So it wasn't smooth. 
-hmm. it wasn't smooth and when you do something like we did it and we didn't know we were creating sort of history with this but when you do this kind of stuff man you're dealing with all the issues that anybody would deal with everybody thinks Tashiono had it smooth i got his bible i can send it to you Mm. people pushed back from all levels in the organization okay it wasn't smooth for Tashiono. everybody says oh the japanese are just going to do what they're told no 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 it wasn't like that at all so it wasn't a smooth deal and everybody looked at the the beautiful iceberg with the sun glistening on it but underneath Mm -hmm. the iceberg if you're not careful that's what sunk the titanic Mm -hmm. okay and and so uh i don't want to give this holier than thou view of danaher and the danaher business system to show that how excellent it was and and all that because i want to talk i think you can learn more about the screw-ups that's right a lot of them we had a lot of them yeah okay so oh, that's great so such good uh points uh, amazing uh share stories value everything that you've talked about is is just spot on mark and i i so much appreciate you being open to share about some of those failures because sometimes that's not easy uh but obviously you know coming out on the other end reflecting and learning and being able to help others you know through some of those same challenges is is massive so thank you for that i know our, our listeners are appreciative of that um, and before we go to uh, you, you do a lot of work for veterans. Can you just real quick, can you give our listeners a, a, a view on the, the nonprofit organization that you run and maybe some of the work that you guys do for veterans? Yeah, you know, it's not even a nonprofit. It's not a 501c3 at all. I don't take any money for it. It's just I've got some people that work with me on this, but it's uh, uh, when I when my son got killed in Afghanistan and I saw the pain my son went through. I got to see what veterans, uh, you know, I got to see, and you're a veteran, a Marine as well, um, but I got to see the pain they went through after they left the battlefield. And the war doesn't end, right? That's right. Uh, for them. And some some guys don't make it. My son just, my, my son Scott just lost his third guy in his platoon uh, to suicide, right? Had two kids, wife. Um, so... I didn't serve. I missed Vietnam by about a year. That's not an excuse, but I didn't serve. But I said, well, what can I do? I have a lot of gifts that God's given me to be able to help veterans, right? So I started an organization to help them start businesses and also help them with their business or help them with their careers, you know? And and I've helped quite a few veterans in that regard. It's called Brave, B-R-A-V-E. It's uh, business reviews and advisors for veteran entrepreneurs. Uh, Not just entrepreneurs, though, you know, people seeking you know, positions and all that. Sure. Um, and uh, it's uh, the, the website is for the brave.org, the number for the brave.org. And we, I just do it. We do it. I do strategic plans. I help them business advice, whatever they need, you know, or I connect them with the right people to be able to do that. So that's something I've been doing now for quite some time. Uh, oh, geez. I don't know how long it's been probably long. eight years, seven, eight years. Uh, and yeah, so that's what it is. And uh, it's all volunteer, no money. People want to give me money for it. I don't want money. So yeah, that's uh, su- such a huge need, and uh, so I appreciate that. I want to thank you, and and we'll make sure that we take that uh, that link and put it in the show notes too. So if anyone's interested to go and check out the website, we'll put that right in the show notes along with uh, your uh, contact info too. So if someone is interested to grab Flatlined uh, or uh, turn waste into wealth uh, or connect with you. Where's the best place to do that? Amazon. Well, the best you could be gotten on Amazon, and my website is leanhorizons.com. Uh, that's our, our consulting address. I'm also doing a podcast, which I'd like to invite you on. It's called lean911.com. Yes. Uh, lean911, uh, where we take a lot of questions from people in terms of the tough stuff that uh, the books don't give you, and most consultants don't either. So, But we'd love to interview you on that podcast as well. I don't usually interview people on it. It's more more me kind of answering questions. But I'm going to change. I'm going to change the format to to get the right people on there that can help uh, help people out. The whole idea with that podcast is just to kind of help people through some of the tough spots of of lean, you know, and uh, uh, that you don't you don't you will not get in a book, (laughs) right? Usually, (laughs) much needed. For yeah. sure. Well, I, yeah. I would be honored and I look forward to that. And again, we'll put all of those links in the show notes. So if anyone's interested, awesome. go there and grab uh, Mark's book or uh, find his website there and, and connect with him. Mark, it's been great to have you on. Again, we we, we got to get do this again, dive into lean accounting or or some of the other areas that strategy. A million things to talk about, Patrick. My God, let's just do it. 
Yes. All right. Well, thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. Have an amazing week. You too. Thank you for having me. I do appreciate it. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of the Lean Solutions Podcast. If you haven't done so already, please be sure to subscribe. This way you'll get updates as new episodes become available. If you feel so inclined, please give us a review. Thank you so much.